Okay, well, uh, thanks for having me. Um, what I'll be talking about is integrating real-time GPS into earthquake early warning. That's what I've been working on um, during the last two years as I was a postdoc here at, at Berkeley with uh, Ingrid Johansson and, and Richard. And uh, so the, the first thing I wanted to talk about was shake, shake alert, but uh, of course, you know, we have a great <coughs> summary and we know there's a demonstration system running. So um, the, the point now of integrating um, real-time GPS into that um, really is uh, to inform better about uh, magnitudes and uh, slip distribution and, um, and finite fault length uh, for, for large earthquakes. And um, a very uh, famous figure that has been uh, published in, in various incarnations is uh, here by Tim Wright and others showing the evolution of seismically derived magnitude for the uh, Tohoku event uh, compared to uh, what we can get out of uh, GPS. Uh, and there is a difference uh, depending on where you look uh, between you know, an order of uh, one magnitude unit or a little bit less, but GPS uh, tends to come up um, with, with more precise estimates. And, uh, and that's what we wanted for California too in case of uh, large earthquakes. Uh, the advantages of GPS are um, that uh, it is, there aren't necessarily as large of uh, tilt errors or drift errors. Uh, there are theoretically no displacement limits, um, <coughs> so you have a very large dynamic range. Uh, but you are fairly insensitive to small ground motion, so that's why GPS comes in for uh, above magnitude six and a half events or something like that, where uh, actually your signal clearly stands out above the real time noise, which has a variance of about you know, a centimeter or so. Um, the way uh, the system we de uh, developed here is uh, triggered through the seismic alarm. So uh, if you have GPS only systems, you for even large events, you will have a hard time to detect a uh, P wave. Uh, and the system, Shake Alert, does a really good job at detecting P waves and sending out alarms. So we hook in as one of the consumers of the decision module right now. Uh, to, uh, to get a seismically derived P, uh, P wave alarm uh, and then uh, set up our processing with information that we get out of there, which is the origin time, uh, the event location, <coughs> the location estimate, uh, and a, um, the initial magnitude that comes out of the seismic system. And we, we use the initial magnitude, if you would imagine having a California-wide system running, uh, to basically just select a subset, a generous subset, uh, of, um, of sites that we would run our processing on where we would expect uh, static offsets. Okay, so uh, the system is called GLARMS, Geodetic Alarm System. Uh, it's the brother or sister of ELARMS basically because it has been developed here. Um, and uh, there's again how, uh, how ShakeAlert is set up right now. There's ELARMS, VS, OnSite, uh, and now also Finder that uh, sends information in there. Into there. On the on the GPS side, we have um, what I would call time series generators. Uh, something like Track RT is what we're using here. There is uh, RTNet or uh, the the new Trimble RTX developments. Something that produces um, GPS position changes or uh, absolute positions in real time. Um, these are fed into into GLARMS and uh, which then does a permanent uh, quality control that runs continuously. We want to know how reliable some, um, some of our offsets are, whether some, um, some uh, stations are out or not, um, <coughs> and, and we will use that later in the modeling. Um, following that, there is a, uh, what we call offset estimator. Uh, so we are working with uh, static co-seismic offsets. We are not doing full waveform modeling or anything like that. What we are interested in is how much did a site move due to the earthquake and, um, and will stay there, so you know, the static offset. Um, <clears throat> the way that's um, calculated is uh, once we get a, an alert from, uh, from ShakeAlert, uh, we uh, determine a prevent position that is averaging the position up to the origin time. Uh, then we wait until uh, the S wave would arrive. Uh, and after that, we start an uh, increasing averaging window uh, where we determine the post event position, take the difference, and we have a static offset for certain stations. Uh, these offsets then go into a second module, which is uh, uh, estimating fault parameters. So um, 
uh, we have um, a number of fault patches, finite fault patches set up, uh, for each of which we um, estimate the strike and dip slip, um, out of which we then get a, uh, a, a magnitude and, uh, and the as uh, associated uncertainties. So those two modules uh, run in parallel. They are both triggered by shake alert. And then uh, what could go back into shake alert is a distributed slip model with uh, magnitude estimates and associated uncertainties. And right now we are working on how to integrate uh, GPS information into, into shake alert. But GLOMS itself is set up. It can send these alerts uh, right now. Um, <clears throat> The real-time system as it is running right now is uh, set up for this uh, network of stations here. Uh, that's a, a, a mix of different organizations that operate these stations. Um, we have the BARD network, that's about 30 sites. Um, there are uh, plate boundary observatory real-time sites that, uh, that we use heavily. There would be more PBO sites that uh, have uh, high-rate data, but they aren't being transmitted in real-time right now. <coughs> And there are uh, USGS sites um, that, uh, that are centered uh, on, on the Bay Area. So overall, we have about 60 stations. <clears throat> the way we're processing this, though, is not absolute positioning. We process pairs of stations. So each of these lines is basically one track or T process uh, along which we get um, baseline displacements. The way this works, uh, to, to catch you up on this, is if you have three stations like this, you can assume that the the black station might be a base station for the red rover, and uh, we get deformation displacement at the rover uh, relative to the base station, and every motion at the base station is mapped into the rover motion. Uh, a second process then uh, might swat, uh, switch that around, and the black station becomes a, ro a rover for the blue base station. And all that just creates is a bookkeeping exercise uh, where Green's functions are basically the difference between rover and, and base. Uh, when you do the inversion for finite slip. <clears throat> okay, so at this point, I was really excited to talk about synthetic tests and um, uh, and real real data tests using the El Mayor event, and uh, I've done that, and and we can talk about that later. But last week, of course, the um, the Napa earthquake happened, and uh, on Saturday, <clears throat> I knew about a bug in the code, and I went into the lab to try to fix the bug. But then I followed the eruption in Iceland, <laughs> which was said to happen, but nothing was going on. And I was distracted from fixing the bug, which was a timing bug. Uh, so everything I'll show is 10 seconds later than it, than it could have been. Um, but there were still solutions. So GLOMS was running in real time. Uh, and here we, see, here we see the epicenter. The closest station GPS site is about uh, 23 kilometers to the south. Uh, and the red lines are the, um, the base stations that, that were used in the first solution. Uh, the, the black circle indicates our generous uh, subset of sites that we would have used. Um, so so every, every baseline that has a point in this circle basically could contribute to the solution. Okay, so the first thing to look at is um, the static offsets and how they evolve over time. So this figure here shows, um, I, I switch out of baseline mode now. I, I use this station, the red dot here, as a reference site um, <clears throat> to show the real-time displacements as they evolve over time. So this is at uh, 26 seconds past the event. Um, and and there, may be, uh, there may be a noise in the site that's just mapped into the entire network. Uh, as a comparison, I took uh, Bill Hammond's um, solutions, the, the final stat, well, not really final, but more final than my solutions, uh, using 24-hour um, average positions uh, from, from uh, several days before and two days after the event to get a, uh, get a more precise uh, offset estimate, and that's shown in blue here. Okay, so uh, I will run this animation now, and you can see how things evolve if things are running as they should. Okay, so there we go. <clears throat> so this is at 26 seconds, 27, and so on. Uh, and, and you can see that um, we get more and more data as uh, uh, the S-wave uh, propagates outwards. Uh, and uh, overall, of course, look, it's, it's real-time data, right? So uh, we are at the very low threshold here, magnitude six, 
the, the static offsets there are small. The maximum ones that I didn't plot are uh, about maybe two and a half to three centimeters. <coughs> and at all of these stations, uh, the blue vectors are about a centimeter. But you can see towards the end, <laughs> Uh, the azimuth and uh, as well as the amplitude at some of these stations agree fairly well. So um, I'm just going to move forward here and uh, show you <coughs> what we get on the GLARM side. So what, what did it do? <coughs> this is a fairly involved plot, um, but it's uh, hopefully straightforward to walk you through this. Uh, these four panels over here show uh, in the solid lines um, in black the east-west motion and in uh, blue, the north-south motion, uh, along a bunch of baselines that are, that are shown here that are close to the, to the event. Uh, the, the crosses show the estimated offset, so that's basically the vectors I showed in the previous animation. Now you'll see that there is an offset here in time. Uh, the, the displacement time series are shown in, uh, as they happen in the field. Uh, the offsets are wall clock time in the lab, so there's data lat latency of about six seconds in there, which is expected. So it's a, it's a feature, not a bug of the, of the plot. Uh, on top, we have uh, the, uh, the estimated magnitudes uh, for each epoch shown uh, in the crosses, uh, and the horizontal line in this plot still is the, uh, the first magnitude that came out of Shapeler, which was a 5.7. So that's just uh, for comparison. In MathView, we have um, our fault that is uh, right here. It's a, a fault model. Now, the important thing I didn't say before is right now GLARMS operates uh, on fault provinces. So we assume we take the shake alert location, and uh, in Northern California right now, we assume that faults are going to be predominantly San Andreas parallel. Uh, they're going to be vertical uh, and um, go from the, from the surface to a depth of 12 kilometers. Those are simplifying assumptions. We work hard on parallelizing everything uh, and, and get more fancy. But for now, it appeared to be a good, a good assumption. Um, <clears throat> So each of these patches is 10 kilometers long, and in pink we can see the, the estimated slip. The maximum for that was um, about six centimeters of slip. Uh, down here we have the north-south uh, cross-section uh, of the fault, uh, and, and we, we show the, uh, the direction of slip. Okay, this also is an animation, or the colors of those baselines is a misfit. So model prediction uh, compared to data. And it's overall good, except for this station, right here, and we, we saw in the beginning it was pointing basically west, and in the, in the end it was basically pointing east, so there's something, uh, it doesn't have a very good sky view, um, but you can see that uh, we are not just coloring everything the same color here. Um, so, so the main points to take away here is that we have the first estimate uh, at about uh, 24 seconds, it could have been 14 seconds had this bug not been, um, hadn't I been distracted, by Icelandic volcanoes. Um, and, uh, and, and then, so 26 seconds later, as we have more data, uh, we are up to a 5.8 and so on. So um, the obvious question now is, um, I'm pretty sure the geodesists in the room are fairly uncomfortable with um, me presenting fault models from real-time data for magnitude six earthquake. So um, I looked at this um, in the following way. Uh, <coughs> On the horizontal axis here, we have the uh, decision module event IDs, just a way to identify things. Uh, this was the, um, the Napa quake. Uh, what I'm showing here is a distribution of estimated magnitudes over the first 60 solutions. So 60 seconds, we have a solution every, every second coming out of GLARMS. <clears throat> and you can see that there's a, there's a range of, of things. If I replay the data, which I did, uh, we have impact of dynamic shaking, and, and all of that goes up a little bit. Um, at the bottom, I'm showing uh, the same thing for the associated uh, misfit of um, the estimated slip model compared to the data. And we can see here uh, that this is a fairly narrow range, fairly low at the bottom. And um, you will later see why that scale is so large. I'm not just trying to be generally impressive here. Um, for what I'm showing here is the same, the same thing for 
13 of the, of the first aftershocks that happened, right? There were lots of aftershocks, uh, shake alerts, send out alarms, and GLARMs operated on all of these. And you see the magnitude distribution. So when you look at it this way, it doesn't really look that impressive, right? I mean, we've not been saying real-time GPS is going to help you for six and a half and above um, because we didn't know any better. There is this real-time noise, and if you invert for it for slip, uh, you, you get a magnitude that is just due to noise. But um, if you actually look at the model quality to the fit, uh, uh, the model fit to the, to the actual data, uh, you get for most of these events that have a larger magnitude, uh, a fairly high misfit and a fairly wide distribution. Now there are a few here that have an apparent good fit, right? We are doing random sampling, so every once in a while you fit noise really well um, with, a, with a larger magnitude. But if we really wanted to push real-time GPS uh, magnitude estimates lower into the noise as we are doing right now, we can still go ahead uh, and use the seismic uh, magnitude estimate as, as another decision criteria and how much we should rely on a higher estimate coming out of GPS. It's fairly un unrealistic that uh, the, the seismic system, which has been proven really well in, um, almost done, yep. uh, which has been proven really well in, uh, in the last two and a half years, uh, that all of a sudden it would uh, detect a magnitude three when really it's a magnitude seven or something like that. Uh, so I'm fairly comfortable presenting these results and showing a slip model, uh, even though the, um, uh, the slip distribution, of course, is really coarse. If you look at, at uh, post-processed estimates, uh, our fault length would be uh, about 35 kilometers, uh, whereas uh, Bill Barnhart and others uh, looked at a fault length and they were about 10 kilometers with a maximum slip of a meter over three kilometers. We are not expecting that. We kind of want to know where the fault is, how long, and how much slip um, to, uh, to assist there. So um, it worked well. We had a solution 25, 24 seconds past the origin time. Could have been 14. And we'll improve everything over the next month to make it even better. So thank you.